Welcome to Peace Now. My name is Trudy Quaif. I'm a member of Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. We're a local organization of friends and neighbors. We've been advocating for peace and justice for over 15 years. I'm your host today, and I'm joined by Joe Lombardo. Thanks for being here, Joe. Sure, glad to be here. Joe is also a member of Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace, <coughs> and he's co-coordinator of UNAC, United National Anti-War Coalition. So Joe is going to talk to us about a recent trip to Venezuela, but uh, first I'd like to ask him a little bit about UNAC. Could you briefly tell us what UNAC is, goal, uh, Joe, and what your goal is? Well, UNAC is a coalition of about 160 organizations, peace and justice organizations nationally. Um, it was started here actually in Albany, and Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace was one of the hosts that um, got it all together. We had a conference in downtown Albany of about 800 people, and UNAC was formed. Um, part of the idea is to strengthen the anti-war movement by getting anti-war groups um, working together and walking down the same road doing as much as we can in a coordinated um, way. Um, we are the largest and main anti-war coalition in the United States uh, today. That's pretty impressive right there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, recently you've had a number of, uh, of uh, really important actions going on. Um, back in March you traveled to Venezuela with a, uh, with a peace delegation from the United States. Could you tell us why you decided to go to Venezuela and uh, what you were trying to accomplish? Well, Venezuela seems to be the um, main country in the crosshairs of the United States um, and U.S. imperialism today. Uh, it's a country that's trying an experiment, which they call socialist, um, to try to make a better life for the people of, of Venezuela. Part of that has been nationalizing some of their resources, including their main resource, which is oil, so that rather than the profits from their oil industry going back to individual um, uh, owners or individual corporations or Wall Street or the U.S. banks, uh, they try to use those resources for the people of Venezuela. And for the first time, whole sections of the extreme poor people in Venezuela are um, uh, seeing a life that they never knew before or homes are being built, uh, they, there's no longer food insecurity, they have medical care and things they never had before. You, uh, on your trip back in March, uh, I know you had some difficulties getting there. Could you just briefly tell us about that? Well, one of the problems is um, that the United States has sanctions against Venezuela to try to make it very difficult for the Venezuelan people in the hope that they will turn against their government. And part of the sanctions, uh, the justification for the sanctions, the U.S. has had a narrative about what's going on in Venezuela. And one of the things we saw from our trip is that the narrative is totally false. It has nothing to do with what's happening in Venezuela on the ground. But part of that narrative is that there's chaos in the streets and that there's violence and people hate the government and they for are forced to do things. This is not the reality at all. There was no chaos in the streets. People were not starving. People were not hungry. Um, people were going about their business in a regular way. But because of this narrative of chaos in the streets, um, the main uh, airline carrier that goes from the United States to uh, Venezuela, which is American Airlines, canceled a lot of its flights, it caused people to scramble to get there. Um, I was able to get in only hours late, but others, it was much longer. But they had, um, cancellation led to a real backup of problems, especially leaving uh, Venezuela. So I ended up being in Venezuela for almost a week more than I intended um, while everybody was scrambling to get on other carriers, Venezuelans, non-Venezuelans that were traveling there and including our delegation. Uh, so it made it very difficult. And it's one of the ways that they just try to make life difficult for the people in many, many little ways as well as very many big ways. 
um, so that they will turn against their their government, or that's the whole of the United States, in interfering into the eternal fair, internal affairs uh, of the government, just as they say we don't want people to interfere into our internal affairs, but the U.S. does it openly and brazenly in Venezuela and many other countries. So you have no doubt that the U.S. is behind what's going on in Venezuela right now? Uh, yeah, I mean, what's happening is uh, in Venezuela there is an opposition, and it's a strong opposition, um, but it's um, almost made up entirely of the upper middle class and upper class sections of the government. Um, and some of them are owners of parts of the industry. The food, for instance, is grown on large farms and ranches um, in Venezuela. And a lot of the owners of these farms and ranches would rather sell the food outside of Venezuela than to sell it to the Venezuelans. So the Venezuelan government tries for land reform and says, OK, well, if you're not going to grow food for Venezuela, we are going to um, allow the um, farmers and small peasants to take parts of the land and grow the food for Venezuela. They also are doing an urban agricultural project where in all the urban areas they take land that's not being used or rooftops of buildings or terraces and um, they grow crops, and right now about 25% of the country's food is coming from these urban agricultural plots, and they expect it to go to about 50% so they can ensure that they will have food security. And it's clear that it's working. I mean, there are, people are not hungry in Venezuela. You could just see that walking on the streets. It's not like Yemen, for instance, where right. people, you could see their bones and they're starving, and that's due to U.S. policy. Mm -hmm. So this idea about starving Venezuelans is part of the narrative, which is simply um, uh, not true. So uh, in walking through the streets and seeing the people, uh, they they have food in the grocery stores, and they're going out to eat, and they're going to work, and they're traveling, going to the doctor if they need to. All these things are still happening? Yes, everything's happening. And especially in the poor areas, they've made uh, there's a whole um, now network of um, uh, medical facilities and clinics. And they use this idea of, of trying to make sure people don't get sick rather than curing them once they are sick. There is problems, though, because a lot of the diagnostic equipment and a lot of the medicine all comes from more advanced industrial countries, and um, the sanctions are not allowing medicines in there. So people are, are dying because they don't have the medicine. Mm -hmm. They don't have the medications. It should be considered a war crime. Mm -hmm. These sanctions are war against Venezuela. It should be considered a war crime. They are killing people. And you will see on the TV people advertising, I don't have any more of this kind of medication. Does anybody have it? Mm -hmm. And people try to get in touch with them and, and try to get it um, for them. So that's difficult. Transportation is free. You go on the subways, it's free. You go on the buses, it's free. Um, since, like a lot of Latin American countries, when people were hungry and poor, um, they gravitated towards the um, uh, urban areas. and. What you see all around Caracas where, and other cities in, throughout Latin America, there were these whole groups of shanty towns that developed. And Caracas is surrounded by mountains. So the higher you go up the mountains, the poorer the people were. You know, And so what, what they did, besides building houses for them, they built 2.5 million um, housing units since 2016. Expect that to be 3 million by the end of this year, and moving people into nice places to live, um, they also did things like put cable cars up those mountains so that the people could get down into the city where the services might be better, where the, they can work and so forth. And the cable cars match up exactly with their subway system, so you get off the cable car from the mountain, you just walk onto the subway system, it's all free. Gas is free. You could drive your car into a gas station, you go up to the pump and you put the gas in, it doesn't cost you anything. Wow. Um, they are really trying to make a, a liv livable society in the United States. It's dead set against it because mm -hmm. all of those things that are free services for people are ways to make profit and money, and that's what the United States is about. And they do not want to see the example of a system 
that uh, tries to pull itself away from there and tries to put human needs ahead of profits. They do not want to see that. That's a danger. They also want the oil um, of Venezuela. Venezuela has the largest uh, reserves of oil of any country in the world. And so the sanctions make it very hard for them to trade with, with countries in the major markets that are the major capitalist markets that support the sanctions because the U.S. imposed them and the Europe and so forth so supports them. So it's, it's very, very difficult for them to trade. Even their oil, it's very difficult for them to trade. The U.S. has now put embargoes on transportation of Venezuelan oil. What that means, will they try to stop tankers in the middle of the ocean, which is piracy, and say you can't do this because we've imposed what right does the United States have to impose sanctions on any country in the world to determine what they can trade, what they can um, <coughs> transport through the oceans. It, the U.S. has no right whatsoever. We just take that right because uh, might makes right and yeah. we are the bully of the world. There's a lot of unnecessary suffering around the world. Absolutely. Now, the, and as far as you can tell, the, the people of Venezuela continue to support their president, Maduro. Yeah. There is a, an opposition, and it, we talk to a lot of opposition people, and the opposition is strong, especially in certain areas. Um, but as I said, it's mainly the uh, its base is in the upper middle class and upper class, and those people also control a lot of things within the society and so have an influence over a wider swath of the population. But it's interesting when you talk to opposition people and Maduro people. Maduro people who basically are the black and the poor and the black people, people with darker skin um, or mestizos uh, or indigenous or Afro-Venezuelans. Uh, um, have always been on the bottom of the barrel, but they represent the majority. There is more blacks than there are whites. A lot of the whites don't even call themselves Venezuelans. They call themselves Spaniards almost. Yeah. Venezuela is a bad thing. But when you talk to these people who are being lifted up for the first time and seeing the possibility of a, a life for their families and for their children, they talk about that, how people are being uplifted and look what we have accomplished. We have medical care, we have services in the ghetto areas that we never had before. You know, they pick up the garbage, they, uh, they are allowed to vote for the first time in, in their history. Um, and when you talk to other people, they say, well, you know, you know, there's not a lot of money, you can't buy the things you used to buy, there's not opportunity, you know, you can't get ahead, I want to go to the United States, the land of opportunity. So in the one case, it's this individualist getting ahead as an individual, and the other head, it's lifting the whole society. And that's really the ideological debate between socialism and capitalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that is what I think is going on there. But I think the um, opposition is in serious decline. Um, the US, I think, made a big mistake by choosing this guy, Guaido, to head the opposition. Guaido, it had a very small right-wing, I would call it a semi-fascist party, very small party, but he's the one the U.S. chose because he was going to be hard-nosed. And so he declared himself president, and the U.S. recognized him right away. Nobody voted for him. They voted for Maduro, and large 70% of the population voted for him in an election that had more um, uh, people voting for, more, a bigger percentage of the electorate voting than we had in our country. And of course, our president didn't get the majority, but um, he got a, a, a close to 70% um, in a four-way race. Uh, so, but Guaido, nobody voted for He didn't right. run. He didn't, he didn't do run. anything. He just proclaimed himself, I am president. And the U.S. said, yeah, here's this guy Guaido. We recognize him as president. Yeah. Yeah. But he was a very small party and um, within the opposition. And the opposition has many parties in it. And his supposed vice president, neither of them have any authority or power within Venezuela. They don't control anything. They don't control any of the agencies, institutions, the police, the military, the uh, you know welfare system, or anything. They don't control anything. Um, they just walk around saying they're president. Um, and uh, but his vice president comes from one of the larger parties, and the and you, you could see there was a conflict between the two because Guaido made some very big mistakes. He, um, on the 
23rd of February, he tried to force this uh, truck with aid into the country. I mean, such a minimal fraction of aid, it would have meant nothing, yeah. but they were going to force it in. So what country would allow a truck to come into their country without having the right to look and see what's inside of it? It could be an atom bomb, for all they know, or it could be weapons, it could be anything, you know. But no, no, they were going to force it in, and Venezuela said, no, so we'll take aid from people, but it has to be on the terms that we know what it is, that we see what it is, that we agree to. Russia just gave them 10 um, million tons of medicine, for instance, and they were very happy to receive that. But they weren't happy to receive this so-called U.S. aid, humanitarian aid, which was just a Trojan horse. Mm -hmm. So they tried to force it in. Of course, it caught on fire. They blamed that on the Maduro government. The New York Times revealed that it was really their forces, because had the pictures of the Molotov cocktail being thrown from the opposition, that the um, truck and caught it on fire. But that didn't work. They, didn't get, they were hoping that would um, spark a coup. There was a billionaire who, who was going to have a big concert on the on the um, uh, Colombian side. The concert fizzled even though they got big mean people. And on the Venezuelan side, masses of people mobilized because they thought that there could be a coup and they were going to stop the coup. And so uh, um, that's what happened on the Venezuelan side. So that didn't work. And he also called for people to leave the military. And they didn't leave the military. You know, the military stood strong for their government. And so that failed. And then he came into the country and he gave a speech. And in the speech he said he calls for the United States to invade his country. Imagine a president of any country calling for a foreign country to invade their country. He did that. And when asked by news people, they said, but you know, a U.S. bomb won't know the difference between an opposition person and a Chavista. He said, well, I know it won't. Um, know the difference, and I know there will be collateral damage, but you have to sacrifice for freedom, was his thing. I think that lost him all support, because they tried two opposition demonstrations when we were there, and we went to them. One just did not materialize at all. The other had about 40 people at it. And yet we were on the pro-Maduro demonstration, and it went as far as you could see, as far as you could see in front of you, and as far as you could see behind you, the sea of red, enthusiastic people that were, were getting the part of it, that they deserve, their needs met for the first time in their history, and they were not going to go back. And the other thing Maduro has done is, besides he has a, a pretty strong and big military, and they have now gotten weapons from Russia, and they, there's Russian troops and Chinese troops, small amounts of Russian troops yeah. and Chinese troops, just to, yeah, just to make it, you know, so that uh, to show their support, basically. Yeah. But um, his military is very big. But what he's done on top of that is he's arming the people. They have in every community they have these things called community councils. And a community council, ten community councils form what they call a commune, and this is part of their direct democracy, where people in the communities can decide what they want, and it goes right up to the legislature. And, and they actually have seats in the legislature that aren't just elected through a, the way we elect that are, are come up through these councils. And um, so they have a direct democracy and a representative democracy that kind of coexist and go hand in hand and work together. But it's through these councils that they, what they've done is they've armed people. Mm -hmm. And so they've given them arms. Now imagine a dictator or an unpopular person giving arms to their population. They would overthrow them, you know? But that's, that's what exists. They have an armed population who are ready to resist, who train. Mm -hmm. And you saw the problems, you see the problems the United States has in Afghanistan. that has been going since 2001. You know, they still haven't been able, the majority of, pa of Afghanistan right now is controlled by the Taliban, the majority of it, you know? And they haven't been able to defeat this poor little country. If they try it in Venezuela, and in Venezuela, a place where the U.S. has, a, in Latin America, a history of coups and military interventions and an opposition, even in the right-wing countries in Latin America, to any U.S. intervention because of this whole assorted history that they have, um, that whole region can explode. And we have a politicized Latino population in this country, this country could explode. The United States would have a very hard time militarily trying to overthrow them, but it's trying with the sanctions to make it very, make life very difficult for them, and, and it is difficult, and they 
work, they work around it, and the government makes sure at least people have a place to live and food to eat and as much of the medical care that they could give them with the, with the sanctions. Okay. Uh, we have about nine minutes left. Uh, I know you met with President Maduro while you were there. Could you tell us a little about that meeting? Well, it was a very interesting meeting. We met for about 90 minutes, and um, uh, he uh, let us know when we got there, there was one of these blackouts that happened. And blackouts are definitely caused by the United States. But with the help of China, they have done some forensic investigation of what happened. The, their whole electrical system actually comes from um, Germany and the United States. And um, so they have traced viruses that have come from Houston and from Chicago that have caused these blackouts. Um, and he tried to explain what they did and how they found this out and, and so forth. He also showed us two tweets he had on his phone. One was from Marco Rubio. It was a picture of Omar Gaddafi from Libya, who was the leader there until we and NATO overthrew them. And he was dead in the street. And that was a threat, basically, to Maduro. Another one was from Elliot Abrams, a convicted criminal. Um, and he said, basically, you know, why don't you just leave? Um, let the opposition come in. And we'll make sure that you're safe. And maybe a few years down the line, you can run again, and maybe you can get back in, and that might settle things down, and so forth. So I was telling them, if you, if you leave, we'll let you live. But if you stay there, we're going to kill you. This is what the United States mm -hmm. of America has said to them. So we saw that. Um, he also was a bus driver, you know, before. And this is what so much of the upper class hate. He was just a working person. He was a bus driver before he got involved in politics and became part of the Chavista movement in the late 90s. And um, uh, so we told him about the demonstration we were holding in D.C. on March 30th, which part of it was to call hands off Venezuela. And we let him know that the bus dri school bus drivers union in D.C. was coming down with a bus. He was enthusiastic, oh, I want to drive the bus, and, and so forth. Um, his wife and his 20-something-year-old uh, son were there, um, and, uh, and us, and a few other government officials were there, but there were no cameras there. When we walked out, there were a lot of cameras, and we gave a press conference, and he held a press conference. And if people go on my Facebook account, you can go down, and you can see the press conference, and you can see stuff of our meeting with him. But he really thinks the U.S. anti-war movement is important. He understands what we did during Vietnam, where the whole population came out against and we really helped stay the hand of the United States in, Venezuela, in Vietnam. Um, and he understands that people power can have a huge effect because of it's having a tremendous effect in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And he, he really wants to see the U.S. anti-war movement grow and push for peace and an end to sanctions in Venezuela. That's exactly what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else you want to tell us about Venezuela before we move on? I wanted to just ask you a little bit about the uh, action that you were just part of that you okay. helped to organize in Washington, D.C. on March 30th. Yes. But, uh, Why don't you go ahead with that? You want to go ahead with that? Sure. Okay. Well, you've just come back from Washington, D.C. Uh, could you tell us about that uh, protest that you helped organize last weekend? Well, NATO was coming to Washington, D.C. It was their 70th anniversary. They were going to have their primary meeting on April 4th, which was also the day of the assassination of Martin Luther King, and it was also the date one year prior to his assassination of his famous anti-war talk, which has been known as Beyond Vietnam where it called the U.S. the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. It's only increased since that time, believe me. So it was a real insult to have this military organization um, come to, uh, to uh, D.C. Plus, Colombia is now the first country that's a NATO partner in Latin America, and Bush is trying to get uh, Brazil also, two countries that border Venezuela. So NATO, everybody was sure that part of the NATO agenda when they were talking here was how to increase pressure and even perhaps make war against Venezuela uh, from NATO. And um, so we held a demonstration the prior Saturday, of, uh, April 4th was a Thursday, so the Saturday before that, which was March 30th, we had a 
large demonstration right outside uh, the White House. Um, and it was a good, spirited, youthful um, demonstration. And then a series of other activities. On Sunday, there was, there was a series of um, anti-NATO conferences, which you know, I spoke at some, and, uh, and other uh, smaller protests when the head of NATO spoke to the a joint session of Congress. We were outside protesting. When they had their actual meeting, we were outside protesting. And so there was a whole series of events. One of the events we did when we were down there was we went to one of the diplomatic buildings of Venezuela where uh, uh, the U.S. has kicked out the diplomats and allowing right-wing Venezuelans to go and take anything they want from the building. So they were carrying out TVs and computers and printers, putting it in their cars, take it away. This is, And the police were there. We got on the phone with people because we had the numbers of people in the government, like the foreign minister. And he said, no, tell them they can't do that. That's ours. It's diplomatic property. It's internationally recognized as diplomatic property. They can't take our property. It's th thievery. But the police were there, and the police supported them stealing. And we, who were protesting the stealing, pushed us off of the property that they considered Venezuelan property, even though the Venezuelan government wanted us to be there, did not want them to be there. And that's property that belongs to the Venezuelan government. The police were on the side of the criminals and that thing. So we did a whole, almost a week of activity against NATO and Venezuela was a real central theme in all of that activity. I just wanted to ask, was the Venezuelan embassy closed at that point while you were doing the, the protest or were they... Were they yeah, they still? kicked out the Venezuelan uh, um, people and closed the embassy. In New York, some right-wing Venezuelans took over the embassy, and they haven't done that in D.C. At one point, anti-war activists, um, including people from Code Pink and other groups, went into the embassy and kind of occupied it uh, symbolically for a while to try to prevent that from happening. And that hasn't happened, but they still are. Those embassies are closed, and they're still stealing stuff from we're just about out of time. We've got about two minutes. Could you just briefly say what you think, what's next for the peace movement? What do we need to do? Well, we're going to have a, an evaluation to, uh, tomorrow, actually, on the phone of the kind of leaders that organize that bit of activity. And hopefully we're going to project um, continuing to work together, specifically around Venezuela, which I think is the central um, uh, piece right now. There's so many other hot areas. Uh, uh, we just declared uh, Iran's military to be a terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. What a stupid thing. But uh, 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 Yemen is dying. Um, many things are happening all around the world, but Venezuela is clearly a very significant and central aspect. So we want to work together on that. And I think it's really important that the American anti-war movement start a campaign against sanctions. We're using sanctions all over the world. Um, in these terrible ways to ensure that countries cannot advance and Venezuela is being the hardest hit by them. And I think we need to start a, a campaign against sanctions, in my opinion. Okay. Thank you so much, Joe Lombardo. Just great to talk with you about this. I hope you'll come back and do this again. And uh, thanks for all the work you do. Anytime. Thank you. Thanks for Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. <laughs>